everyone, I'm Adam Harrington, and in this video we are going to explore a hemlock forest in search of interesting plants and mushrooms. Now, when I first found my way back into nature, which believe it or not wasn't actually too long ago, relatively speaking, some of the first areas that I started exploring were areas that looked like this. They were hemlock forests. And I really like these areas because they're typically cool, they're dark, they're moist, they're shaded, they smell really good, and all different kinds of interesting plants and mushrooms are associated with these areas. Now, whenever you study the history of the northeastern United States, and specifically the history here in Pennsylvania, you soon realize that not too long ago, our hemlock trees were much older, much more massive. However, by the latter half of the 1800s, after all the white pine trees were cut, the hemlock trees were next. And the bark was used in the tanning industry, and hemlock lumber was also very popular. And so by the 1920s, almost all of our trees were gone and the land completely deforested. Since then, some of these forests have been allowed to regrow, and although these forests are of a different character compared to the old growth forests, which graced our land not too long ago, many of the plant and mushroom communities have been allowed to reestablish themselves. And so what we are going to do in this video is find some of these incredible plants and mushrooms that call this area home. Let's go see what we can find. Now before we get started, I should probably help you positively identify an eastern hemlock tree, Suga canadensis, just in case you're not familiar with this tree species. So, if you live in Pennsylvania, this is the state tree of Pennsylvania. And this is a very shade tolerant evergreen species. So you will oftentimes see them in the shade in the understory, 10, 15, 20 feet high. You'll see much larger specimens at the top of the canopy and age classes all in between. It's very easy to identify based on the leaves because these leaves or needles are flattened and on the bottom there are two silver strips. These are the stomata. This is how the plant breathes. Now in the early part of the season, so we're approaching the summer solstice, you can see these active growing tips. They're light green or lime colored. You can eat these. They're lemony, they're kind of citrusy. And I really like them. I treat them as a trailside nibble. I generally don't harvest a whole lot of these and bring them home, but I do nibble on them from time to time whenever I find them in the forest. So now that you know what an eastern hemlock tree looks like, let's go see what other plants we can find. Here's a plant that many of us are familiar with, but at the same time, a lot of us are not familiar with it. So what do I mean by that? Well, these are nettle plants right here, but these are not stinging nettle plants. So many times whenever we get stung by a plant in the woods, we just call them all stinging nettles, right? Well, there's a difference between stinging nettle and this plant. This is wood nettle. It's somewhat related. It's in the same family, but it's in a different genus. So this plant is Laportia canadensis. If you're walking through a mature forest, a hemlock forest, area with a lot of rich soil, then you might be coming across wood nettle Laportia canadensis. If you're out in the open, if you're on the farm, if you're in an area with a lot of light coming down, then you might have stinging nettle, which is Urtica dioica. Some of the key differences just include the leaf arrangement. In stinging nettle Urtica dioica, the leaves are completely opposite one another in pairs. With wood nettle, you'll see that they are alternate one another. They're staggered left, right, left, right, all the way up and down the stalk. Now that genus name Laportia comes from an entomologist who spent a lot of time collecting specimens in the 19th century here in the United States. His name was Francois-Louis de Laporte, so this plant was named after him. And then Canadensis comes from Canada, obviously, because perhaps that's where this plant was first described. So the wood nettle grows to be between two to four feet tall, and it does sting, so you gotta watch out. Now, I can touch it right now because the leaves aren't that bad, but I know if I brushed up and down against the stalk, I'd get stung pretty badly. So just like stinging nettle, Urtica dioica, this plant has those trichomes, little hypodermic needles, the silicone tip breaks off and injects into you a chemical cocktail full of various neurotransmitters and hormones. So just be careful as you're walking around the woods. Fortunately though, just like stinging nettle, this plant is edible. This plant might have more edible uses compared to stinging nettle. So in mid-spring when the shoots are first starting to appear, they could be harvested, they could be cooked, and they can be eaten. And right now, some of these tender tops where the leaves are still only about an inch or less across, maybe an inch and a half, two inches across, those can be harvested and they're actually not very formidable. So if you just pop some of these off, you can see they're only about an inch and a half across. And I'm not getting stung harvesting these. They're very mild, much milder than stinging nettle urtica dioica. So they're very tasty and I'm not getting stung eating these. So I'll harvest some of these, bring them home. 
I will typically cook them up though, just to remove any signs of those stingers. These bigger leaves though, I probably only harvest these and use these in teas. So if you do harvest some of the bigger specimens, some of the bigger leaves, as long as you dry them out, the sting will go away. Or if you cook them, the sting will go away. But some of these bigger leaves are just too tough to cook up in just a typical stir fry. But these younger leaves are very good. Now interestingly, wood nettle doesn't have all the medicinal research on it that stinging nettle has. So whenever we look at stinging nettle, it's quite a medicinal plant in regards to BPH, allergies, and diabetes. Whenever we look at Laportia canadensis, it doesn't mean that it's not medicinal if there's no medicinal research on it. Of course it's medicinal. It's in the forest, and everything in the forest is medicinal to some degree. Just the research isn't there. But it's a fantastic edible plant. I encourage you to get out and look for this plant this time of year. Again, check mature forest, kind of like this. Areas along floodplains, along streams, with a lot of rich soil. This little plant down here is one that you could see all year round. But this time of year, as we're approaching the summer solstice, the flowers are out. And so I encourage you to look at the flowers right now because they look beautiful and they smell fragrant as well. So this is partridge berry, Michela repens. There's one right here, some down here. There's one up here as well. So this is in the coffee family or the matter family, Rubiaceae. Unfortunately though, I don't think it contains any caffeine. But maybe you're familiar with some other wild plants in the coffee family. Those would be cleavers or bed straws in the gallium genus, also bluets in the Houstonia genus. These are all in the Rubiaceae family. So Michela, the genus name, is named after John Mitchell, who was an 18th century physician and botanist who spent a lot of time in Virginia. And then repens means creeping because of this plant's creeping habit. So partridge berry is pretty easy to identify because it creeps along the ground. It's an evergreen plant, so you can identify it all year round. The leaves are opposite one another, and each leaf has a prominent midrib or vein that goes right through the center of each leaf and it's typically lighter in color compared to the rest of the leaf. Now right now you can see these beautiful little flowers and what's so fascinating about the flowers of partridge berry is that they're fused at the base. So they're pairs of flowers that are fused at the base. Each flower is trumpet shaped and I encourage you to smell it if you find it. Because they smell really, really good. And you wouldn't know it just by walking around here. I mean, most people wouldn't even notice this plant because it just lays so low to the ground. It's very inconspicuous and very humble. But if you get really close and you smell it, then it really, really starts to shine. So the ovaries are fused right here, and then these will eventually transform into fruits, which will appear throughout the autumn months into winter, then they will overwinter. And you can find the fruits probably even right now. I just don't see any in this particular cluster. And on each fruit, you will see two dimples. These are the remnants from these two ovaries that are fused right here. So you can see that in the fruits. Now this plant, partridge berry, had been used and probably is still being used as a parturient to encourage labor and to ease childbirth. And fortunately, those fruits are edible, so you can eat them. I guess the only downside is that they're not that tasty. They just don't taste like much. I guess there's a slight taste if you're really, really hungry and if you haven't eaten anything in a while. But I like finding this plant all year round, and I encourage you to find it right now because of these beautiful flowers. So this mushroom right here is one of the reasons that I absolutely love exploring hemlock forests right around the summer solstice. This is the reishi mushroom, Ganoderma suge. This has been a staple in my medicinal strategy for the past seven or eight years. So I absolutely love finding it every single year. And so this belongs to the genus Ganoderma. That's a pretty large genus of polypore mushrooms. Worldwide, they're estimated to be between 250 to 400 species. This genus originated in the tropics and has recently expanded its range into the temperate zones. So interestingly, according to many mycologists, this genus Ganoderma is one of the most difficult of all polypore genera to identify the species level because the caps of many mushrooms, especially the reishi mushrooms, look very similar. Fortunately though, this one's very easy to positively identify because of its substrate. And the substrate is the eastern hemlock tree. That's where we get the Latin name of this mushroom, Ganoderma suge. Suge comes from Suga canadensis, the eastern hemlock tree. So Ganoderma, Ganos is Greek for sheen or bright, and derma is skin because of the varnished appearance of this cap. So this mushroom is also known as the hemlock varnish shelf. Whenever we look at the Ganoderma genus, we could basically subdivide that genus into two main groups, the lacate species and the non-lacate species. The lacate species are the ones that contain the varnished appearance of the waxy coating to the cap surface, like this reishi mushroom. The non-lacate species are the ones that do not contain that varnished appearance. Those would be members of the Ganoderma aplanatum complex or the Ardis conch mushroom. And so whenever I'm looking through the forest and I find Ganoderma suge, I'm always excited because I like to make medicine out of this fungus, specifically dual extracted tinctures. I find that they go down really well. So for the past seven or eight years, almost on a daily basis, I've been consuming this mushroom. 
And there's some good research on it showing that it has immunomodulatory properties, anti-cancer properties, antihistamine properties. And interestingly, a new study from 2016 showed that extracts from this fungus have the potential to protect cells against the damaging effects caused by air pollution. So I really enjoy this fungus, and if you have access to this mushroom, I encourage you to get out there right now, right around the summer solstice, see if you can find it and perhaps make it a part of your medicinal strategy as well. So I'm seeing a lot of cool perennial plants, all kinds of different things associated with this particular area. I'm seeing some violets, I'm seeing some Solomon seal, Hartley foam flower, Jack in the pulpit, and some others. But what's really catching my eye, this fern right here, and also some of these fungi. Do you see these white spindly structures just coming up out of the soil? These probably just appeared yesterday, maybe the day before, maybe even this morning. This is a fungus known as Claveria vermicularis. And vermicularis refers to its worm-like nature. This is a very fragile fungus. If you just take your hand and smack it, these things will just break. So it's very hard to move, very hard to collect. It's very beautiful to see in person. And so this isn't too distantly related from your typical cap and stem mushroom, like your honey mushroom, or your meadow mushroom, your portobello mushroom, because all those belong to the same phylum known as Basidia micata. These mushrooms have spores that are born on structures known as Basidia. Contrast that to the morel mushroom, other cup fungi, they have spores that are born in structures known as acai. So it's actually very different. So morels in this mushroom, distantly related. But this fungus right here and your portobello mushroom, your white button mushroom, they're actually not too distantly related. So I typically find this fungus just in like floodplain areas along streams, so disturbed areas. And as I said, it's very hard to collect, so it's best left just in the field. Take a picture of it and you can appreciate it. Now another thing that's catching my eye right here is this fern. It's a very unique fern. It's a very easy to identify fern. This one's known as the rattlesnake fern, Botrachium virginianum. So this belongs to the adder's tongue family, Ophioglossaceae. So that genus Botrychium, there are about 50 to 60 species worldwide, and plants in this genus are known as moonworts or grape ferns. Now that genus name Botrychium comes from the Greek word botrychios, which is in reference to botrice, which means a bunch of grapes. Because whenever you look at the sporangia, the spore-bearing structures, it kind of looks like a bunch of grapes. Now, Botrychium virginianum is the most widespread Botrychium in North America, and it's actually pretty easy to identify, especially when you look at the stalks. So when you look at this spore-bearing stalk, it connects up high to the leaves right here. It's directly connected. They're not two separate stalks that go all the way down to the ground level. If you see it going all the way down to the ground level, it's two separate stalks, and it's probably a different species of Botrychium. But right here, they're directly connected about eight to 10 inches up off the ground. So that tells me that this is the rattlesnake fern, Botrychium virginianum. Now what's really interesting about rattlesnake ferns and other species in the Botrychium genus is that they are obligate mycotrophs, meaning they require the existence of mycorrhizal fungi in order to survive and thrive. So these ferns are nearly impossible to cultivate from spores. Now the rattlesnake fern forms from underground structures that lack chlorophyll. And they actually take many years to develop and their survival is dependent on the presence of mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, which exchange nutrients with the rattlesnake fern. Now we can't really see the mycorrhizal fungi that are associating with the rattlesnake fern. They're microscopic fungi that are in the soil. It's not like this Claveria vermicularis is hooking up mutualistically with the rattlesnake fern. It just so happens that they share the same habitat. So I encourage you to get out there, see if you can find this grape fern, the rattlesnake fern, Botrychium virginianum, or other members of the Botrychium genus. So whenever you're in an eastern hemlock tree forest, almost always you're going to come across companion plants. Of course, we already talked about a lot of companion plants, but we didn't really talk about companion trees. Almost always when you're looking at eastern hemlock trees, if you take a look around, you're going to see birch trees growing in the same area. And what's interesting is that the eastern hemlock tree is a late successional species. It'll typically dominate in later forests, more mature forests. But the pioneer species, like the birch tree, it's one of the first species to colonize the area, especially when there's a lot of light penetrating the forest floor. So this is one of my favorite birch trees. It's the black birch, Betula lenta, also known as the sweet birch. I really like this tree because of the way that it smells. If you take a knife, if you just scratch into a twig, and you get into the bark, it smells like wintergreen. It's a very pleasing aroma. Now there's something interesting about this tree, and it's actually on the other side. I'm really excited to find this other thing on the underside of the tree. So come around to the other side, and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. So this is it, this is what I was talking about. This is Chaga, Inonotus obliquius, everyone's favorite medicinal sclerotium. 
So I'm actually really excited to find it here because in this particular area, I've never seen chaga. I'm seeing it on this black birch tree and I rarely if ever see it on a black birch tree. I almost always find chaga a little north of here, especially on yellow birch trees, which is Betula alleghaniensis. But I'm excited to find it today. This is a fungal pathogen. In this specifically, this structure is known as a sclerotium. Sclerotia are produced by many species of fungi. They're densely compacted masses of hyphae or fungal strands. And these persistent structures help protect the fungus against environmental conditions and stresses, including desiccation, freezing temperatures, and microbial invasion. Now what's interesting about Inonotus obliquius, that's the Latin name, is that this fungus used to be in the Boletus genus, if you can believe that, also in the Poliparous genus, also in the Felinus genus. Now it's in the Inonotus genus, and Inonotus means fibrous ear. Obliquius is the species name, perhaps in reference to the oblique structure of this, or the oblique pores that are produced by the fertile structure, which is rarely seen. So this is sterile right here. No spores are shot out of here, so we can't really call this a mushroom. The fungus is actually inside this tree. It's attacking live cambial tissue as a parasite. And then when the tree dies, sometimes we peel back the bark, you will see the fertile structure, which is the pore surface because it is a polypore mushroom and then the spores are dispersed that way. Now, just like the hemlock reishi mushroom that we previously discussed, this one chaga has been studied for its medicinal properties. And I enjoy consuming homemade medicines made from chaga, including dual extracted tinctures and hot water decoctions. And with those hot water decoctions, because they're pretty mild, they go with a wide variety of beverages. You can use them as a base for coffees, for hot chocolate, for smoothies, for juices, and a whole host of other different things. Now, as far as the medicinal research, there's a tetracyclic triterpenoid found within this fungus known as anodiol, which has been studied for its pharmacological activity. Maybe you've heard of other compounds, betulin and betulinic acid. Both of those compounds are actually synthesized by the birch tree, hence that genus name betula. Then they become concentrated in this sclerotium and made bioavailable for us. If we just harvest this, we can get those compounds into our bodies. Those compounds have been studied for their anti-diabetic properties, antimicrobial properties, anti-arthritic properties, hepatoprotective and anti-cancerous properties. So if you're exploring an eastern hemlock tree forest, look around for the birch trees and perhaps you'll get lucky and find Inonotus obliquius, the chaga fungus. All right, so this is just some cool plants and mushrooms that I'm finding today on this walk through an eastern hemlock tree forest. Now those plants and mushrooms don't always just grow in association with eastern hemlock trees. Of course, you can find a lot of those in other areas as well, but if you have an eastern hemlock tree forest where you live, there's a good chance you'll find those species and more this time of year. If you don't have access to an eastern hemlock tree forest, come on out here to western Pennsylvania. I'll show you around, show you what's possible this time of year. Thanks so much for tuning into this video. As always, I truly appreciate it. Head on over to learnyourland.com. You can sign up for the email newsletter. We can stay in touch that way. Feel free to subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel or follow me on social media at Learn Your Land. Thanks again. I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.